Dreaming of a better sleep? Tossing and turning is not your destiny. And Ollie is here to help. Ollie invites you to sink into sweet, sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness. More than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Window. Your work can take you all over the place, like Texas. You've never been, but it's going to be great because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. Their free bright side breakfast will give you energy for the day ahead. And after, you can unwind using their free high-speed Wi-Fi. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you shine. Book your stay today at LQ.com. Good morning, crypto. In the area of stable coins, uh, certainly every day uh, we continue to negotiate between the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans. So it's a very bicameral, bipartisan negotiation. Uh, we've gotten good technical assistance feedback from uh, the Fed uh, on that component of the Lummis Gillibrand bill. So I I, I'm optimistic that we will see stablecoin legislation this year um, and possibly even in the first half of this calendar. Progress. Good morning, Warriors. Hello and welcome back to another episode of your favorite crypto news channel, Good Morning Crypto, where we bring you the most relevant and impactful crypto related topics from a top crypto research team in the world. And today we're going to be getting right into one of our topics because the breaking news from this morning was Ripple will be launching a US dollar backed stablecoin on both the XRPL and the Ethereum network. So that's where we're going to be starting the show off today. But first of all, Gonzo, how are you feeling this morning? And thank you for being here. I'm doing great, man. Like this is like my first full week. So it, it's been nice, you know, just uh, looking at the charts and, and doing my thing. But um, yeah, you know, uh, we got some positive price action in XRP. We can look at the chart later, but kind of an exciting morning. Andrew Cashflow, it's always exciting to have you back on the show as well, my friend. And like the breaking news from this morning, Ripple is going to be launching a U.S. dollar stablecoin that aims to compete with Tether and USDC. And we've got some USDC announcements to make today as well. But first of all, how are you feeling this morning? Thanks for being here. Hey, good morning, good evening, good afternoon here from the Netherlands. Yeah, I'm feeling great. And uh, I, I had to laugh so much this morning when I was, pre when I was uh, preparing for the show. I saw an article of CNBC that says, yeah, Bitcoin tumbled $5,000 in, in 24 hours. And then I thought, so what's that? That's only 6 or 7%, you know? And if, uh, for example, Dogecoin tum tumbles 5% or 7%, it goes from 22 to 20 cents, you know, and then nobody's talking about. It. So here you see that the hype is always made and the fear is injected in the in the public. So, uh, you know, just always get the perspective, zoom out. And that's also what we do here in this show. So I'm looking forward also to work with Gonzo and Mario and Epps. It will be a great show today again. It will be a great show. And Mario, I'm excited to break down some of these topics with you. When we've had you on the show throughout this entire week, people have been saying, Mario, you were right. These are the pullbacks that we've been waiting for. Well, now we're seeing people get overly bearish as hedge funds are shorting Bitcoin at an extraordinary rate. If we don't reach that $74,000 mark by the time of the Bitcoin halving, we are going to see the majority of miners be not profitable anymore. So it's safe to anticipate one of two things will happen. We're going to reach $74,000 by April 21st or Bitcoin has some bearish and red days ahead. But first of all, how are you feeling, my friend? And thank you for being here. Feeling great. Thank you for having me, Abs. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing amazing. Super excited to be here with Gonzo and uh, and um, and Mr. Cashflow. It's a full house today, so I'm excited about that. And look, um, I'm not so sure about like the whole narrative of us needing to be at those levels by the having. I mean, if we look at the crypto market, we typically... We typically don't even reach an all-time high before the halving. So, you know, we're moving at a faster pace. Uh, so I don't personally, I'm not personally focused on us being at those levels. Uh, although I'm not discarding it, I would love to, you know, look into that 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 idea. But I think that the crypto market has been doing pretty well. And so, you know, any short-term 
uh, corrections are actually healthy for for the charts and you know for what we have coming in the future. And if like, I can add something, Abs, you know, I, I think a lot of people kind of misunderstand the having because of like the hype that gets put around it. But when you look back at the previous cycles, usually we get like a pre having kind of dip. We hit the having. Sometimes we get a, a another like dip, right? but mostly it's sideways, right? The next few months is sideways. I think people like misunderstand and think that we're going to hit the halving and then all of a sudden we go parabolic and that's just not the way. It's usually like sideways. Sometimes it's been a little bit down. When you look at the RSIs on the monthly, like every single cycle going back, our, our, our stochastic RSI in the monthly has turned down, right? The two little lines that turned down. Every single time we've done that, Usually we have a green candle for the monthly and then it turns into a red candle. So I wouldn't be surprised we had a really big green candle last month and then the April candle is gonna be red like it usually is, right? But like nothing to panic sell over, like it's just what Bitcoin usually does. Absolutely, Gonzo. And I wanna reiterate, we are seeing more institutions come in and start dominating the crypto mining sector. So even just during last bull, last bull run, you could purchase a Bitcoin miner and make a decent amount of income. That doesn't seem to be the way it is this time around. And I think after this halving, that gap is only going to be exaggerated over these next 12 to 24 months. We already got 746 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. And thank you for joining us on this Thursday. Thursdays aren't the most exciting days, guys. But 24 hours from now, we've got some groundbreaking news releasing part three of the XRP Unleashed documentary. And we're going to be doing that on this show tomorrow morning. So be sure to set your notifications on. But we're going to start this thing off the same way we always do. Checking out some of our daily movers. Flare is down nearly 13%. Bitcoin's up 2%. BNB is up 5%. But the market, it's fairly split across the board. We got some tokens up one, some tokens up 5% on the day. When we check out some of our daily movers, or sorry, our total coin market cap this morning, we're sitting at 2.55 trillion in total market cap. Bitcoin is 52% dominance. Ethereum is about 16%. We've got Bitcoin sitting at 67,700. Ethereum is 33.83. We've got Solana token trading at $188 and XRP back below 60 cents. I did see we got a pretty big green candle this morning, but already that has diminished. And guys, you're not going to wait. We're not going to keep you waiting for this breaking news as Ripple is launching a US dollar stablecoin aiming to compete with US dollar Tether and USDC. Ripple expects the stablecoin market to surpass $2 trillion by 2028, and it aims to compete with Circle and USDT. So XRP issuer Ripple has announced plans to launch a US dollar-backed stablecoin with hopes to compete with Circle and Tether for a slice of the market over the next five years. Cointelegraph spoke to David Schwartz ahead of the announcement, which he outlined plans for stablecoins that will initially be issued on the XRPL and the Ethereum blockchain. It's funny that you asked the question. We don't have an answer to it yet. What's the ticker going to be and what are we going to call it? You're just going to have to wait and for right now call it the Ripple stablecoin. And there were some funny rumors going around on Twitter. I saw Digital Asset Investor put out XUSDC. There's USDCX. So that's going to be something exciting. Ripple has been toying with the idea of launching a stablecoin for over a year. And Schwartz believes the existing stablecoin ecosystem is not diverse and robust as it could be. Pinning the stablecoin's market current value at $150 billion, Schwartz said there's room for another big player. We think it will be over $2 trillion market by 2028, and there's only two real market leaders. We don't think it's a winner-take-all ecosystem, particularly on the DeFi side. Ripple stablecoin will be backed one-to-one -one with the ratio of a U.S. dollar, and the company plans to back tokens with the U.S. dollar deposits, short-term U.S. government treasuries, and other cash equivalents. Schwartz said that Ripple would look to emulate Circle's focus on compliance and likely aim to compete against the USDC coin. So I think that's a good place to pause it and get some comments. And there's a lot of places that we can start on this article in particular, Gonzo, but let's address the big numbers, right? First of all, David Schwartz is coming out stating he believes this will be a $2 trillion market. That's a 20X by 2028. That is only four calendar years from now. That's just stable coins. So what does he believe the entire crypto market will be? probably somewhere around eight to $10 trillion. That's my safe estimate. What are some of the things that you're, you're taking away from these details? And then I'll provide more specific questions. Yeah. So when you look at different ecosystems, you really do need a stable coin or at least access to a stable coin to grow that network, right? When people like talk about Cardano or ADA, that's been one of the biggest issues, right? As far as liquidity and, and when is it going to get like a stable coin, right? Or access to USDC, things like that. And so I, I think it's a big deal. I think that we're going to get 
Um, I think it all kind of lines up with the stablecoin regulation that's coming. And then Ripple, like we talk about Ripple, the company, and how it's going to become the Amazon of the financial world. And these are the kind of moves that they're doing to make that happen. How that's going to kind of tie in XRP still remains to be seen. I think it's early. We got a price pump and we just got rejected at our trend line. So until we break out, like it kind of is what it is, but it does bring liquidity to that e ecosystem. And I think a lot of people are waiting for Bitcoin to break their all time high before these altcoins explode. We're going to be breaking down some other sectors of the crypto economy that are set to explode over these next couple of years. The AI ecosystem right now is less than a 35 billion dollar industry. That's an industry that could easily reach a trillion dollars during this next cycle. And I want to point out this comment that somebody had right here. Crypto E said XRP will be lucky to hit one dollar this year. I'm going to ask our live chat that exact question. So while Mario's giving his initial response, I'll ask the live chat, do you believe XRP hits a dollar this year? And we'll vote on it and address it by the end of the show. But Mario, what are some of your key takeaways? And we'll kick it to Andrew Cashflow. Yeah, this sounds like great news. I mean, if it's going to be launched on the XRPL, it's going to add utility to the XRPL, you know, more, more volume with this, uh, with this stable coin. So I'm excited about that. This also exposes kind of like everything that Ripple has been, has been working towards, you know, they, they acquired Medico, which, you know, uh, reveals their plans with the whole custody services solutions. And uh, they've been working on all these money transmitter licenses, they've got chartered banking applications. So I think this is a step in the direction which uh, we're starting to see Ripple go towards. And they're really uh, creating this 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 like really big footprint in the new financial system. And not only are they releasing, you know, uh, innovative products, but they're also placing themselves and acquiring companies that could potentially be like powerhouses when it comes to like all these different evolutions that we're seeing in the in the financial system. So I think the stablecoin is a great idea. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of like variations of of stable coins being launched. It seems to be um, like it seems to be the the as we're talking about the regulation, it seems to be that first step that we're going to get this year. We're 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 like we've got the regulation or or the bill for stable coins at the forefront. It's something that's being spoken about and potentially being like addressed and finalized this year. So it's very likely that Ripple is you know obviously aware of that. And that's why they're making this move, trying to get that kind of first mover advantage, even though we already have two pretty well established uh, stable coins in the market with USDT and USDC. Obviously, you see USDT, we still have a lot of uh, unclarity when it comes to its status, but USDC is definitely a winner. It's got the backing of, of a, a lot of key players and Ripple's getting in. And I think that that's a good move on their part. Guys, I do want to kick it over to Andrew Cashflow really quick, but let me just give another update right here, Andrew. The head of global policy at Circle is congratulating Brad Garlinghouse and the Ripple team on their US dollar stablecoin launch. So this was a tweet from this morning, and I want to just read one more thing before I kick it to you. He stated, congratulations to Brad Garlinghouse, Stuart Alderati, and the Ripple team with your move into dollar-backed stablecoins. It's like PayPal's before it. It underscores how US regulatory clarity can create a growing market in the US and export product of digital dollars around the world. Everyone knows the dollar's value is collapsing and stablecoin stablecoins backed by the US dollar have an opportunity to give us much more utility. Floor is yours, Andrew Cashflow. What's your biggest takeaway? Mute. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, stablecoins. Um, I remember the time that was 2018, 2019, that you were you were from a lot of coins, you were only able to trade them with with bitcoin so you could buy with bitcoin you could buy ada atom uh, or, or other coins and you know it is so difficult to wrap your head around a currency or a, a currency value that you're not used to use so as soon as more stable coins are, are are entering in the network in the crypto uh, ecosystem then the more people start understanding because you have reference of dollars everybody know what is the value of a dollar so if you have a, a yeah a, a one of one backed stable coin with dollars yeah it, it will help enormously also the 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 the, the psychological acceptance of of this uh, of this ecosystem because we are always talking about dollars we you know we will we'll talk about bitcoin yeah is it seventy thousand dollars and we'll no, never express bitcoin for example in uh, in the in how many how many ethereum it is or something like that so I think it's a pretty good move. And by the way, 
that uh, yeah that you is the uh, that guy from USDC is congratulating uh, uh, Greg Carlinghouse. I can understand it. You know, it gives more adoption of crypto uh, in 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 the crypto market. So I think it's only good, and uh, it, it's a good development. And I hope they they will yeah yeah will will, uh, will yeah speed it up a little bit. And let's get into some of the details about this U.S. dollar backed stablecoin here, Mario, because. This is going to open up a plethora of use cases specifically in the United States. And one of my biggest takeaways from reading this is, first of all, how are they going to be offering a U.S. dollar stablecoin to institutions in the U.S.? According to their prior ruling in the Ripple lawsuit, that is something that is yet to be approved inside of the United States. So we can get into some of the conspiracies later in the show. But when it comes to enabling new use cases, a stablecoin could enable a plethora of use cases both inside and outside of the United States giving people many of the same capabilities that USDC does, but enabling the XRPL to provide faster, more efficient payments that almost never fail. Let's read a couple of details, and we'll kick it back to Gonzo and Mario here. Uh, let me just delete that. Our angle is going to be a compliance first, said Davis Schwartz. We're very transparent about how these assets are backed, so we're kind of going to be directly competing against USDC. We're looking to grab a market share. We're not looking to finesse a couple of extra decimal points by taking risks with other people's money, Schwartz added. When he was questioned about Ripple's plans to back a stablecoin with US dollar deposits, as well as cash equivalents. He, uh, Schwartz went on to elaborate, drawing comparisons to the early days of Tether, where critics often sounded the alarm over potential of an issuer stealing funds and the credibility of its reserve when it comes to these assets. The CTO of Ripple added that the reality of launching a new stablecoin could attach hundreds, even millions, billions, or tens of billions of dollars that would lead to these types of concerns. The company is leaning on its credibility and track record in the space, as well as its strong balance sheet to squeeze its way into the stablecoin market. That's a pretty funny way of putting it. Here's a direct quote from David Schwartz. I think we have a credible claim to be in the conversation near the top. If at the end of two years, we're still number three, but the market has grown 10 times to what it is today, that's still pretty good. And let's use some estimates. If they're the third largest stablecoin here, Mario, in a $2 trillion market, which is what David's predicting by 2028, that means that we're going to have at least hundreds of billions of dollars floating on top of these ledgers in the form of a stablecoin backed by US dollars. That's not only going to create more money for the people holding these tokens, it's going to create credibility for these networks at the same time. So Ripple was interested in offering a stablecoin because it continues to position its token for real-time cross-border payment system, currency exchange, and a remittance network primarily catering to financial institutions. Well, why wouldn't they just use XRP, the Cointelegraph person, asked David Schwartz. And Schwartz stated that RippleNet serves non-bank payment companies using XRP for transparent payments. However, there are some markets that these firms cannot get into using XRP or supplement that liquidity. Having multiple paths to give the customer a better experience means you have more customers. And if we only did things with XRP, then where XRP wasn't available, we would just have to tell our customers no. The introduction of a Ripple stablecoin is also set to complement the ecosystem's recently launched automated market maker. And that's what I'm going to be getting into for the next portion of this show. But I wanted to pause it there and get some comments. Floor is yours, Mario. What are some of your key takeaways? I think that that was very smart on their part. You know, a company that's been under fire from the SEC and it's got the experience of what it feels like to be under regulatory uncertainty. I, I, I would, I, you know, I would highly doubt that they went into this without really doing their homework and making sure that they're doing things the right way. The other thing that I see is that also, despite everything that's happened to them in the United States, they chose the U.S. dollar as the first stable coin to be you know, that they're going to be issuing. So they could have gone for, you know, the one of the other currencies that that they've been working uh, with, you know, pretty, pretty well over the last few years, but instead they chose to go the US dollar coin route. So that tells me that they're still confident in their position in the United States. That tells me that they're confident in what's going to come out from this uh, lawsuit with the SEC. Uh, you know, the $2 billion that the SEC is asking we know that they can't afford it. We know that it was most likely run them out of business. So the fact that they're still making these moves despite of what's going on, I think that those are great indications. And I think that, you know, the more competition that we have in this type of uh, market, the better it's going to be. The more the, more the technology is going to uh, advance, it's going to push the competitors to also 
think of more creative ways to to like innovate with their products. So competition is never a bad thing. And and I'm, you know, I'm happy that they went along this route. It's giving me the indication that things could actually be looking bright in the United States for Ripple. I agree with you, Mario. And I'm going to kick it straight to Gonzo and then Andrew Cashflow here. But remember the graphic that we broke down yesterday, Gonzo. Raul Paul stated that we are in the process of onboarding a billion users by the end of 2025. A lot of that is going to come through some of these opportunities that stable coins offer. But think about that. In the next 18 to 24 months, this market is going to have a billion users. Imagine the people who are front running this industry. This market is about to explode, whether it's from institutional adoption or new use cases in third world countries. There's plenty of new money coming into this market, and we talk about it every day. But what's your initial reaction to the US dollar stablecoin and the elaboration that not only are they ready to compete in this industry, they're coming after USDC in these next couple of years? Um, I, I think when you tie everything together, as far as Larry Fink making his announcements about real world assets, and you look about traditional finance and what they're trying to do, right? Especially with that project, Biddle. When you talk to the uh, the founder uh, of that project and he was talking about how right now they're dealing with fiat, but they want to eventually rotate into a stable coin. So they'll get instant settlement and then they'll use a stable coin. They'll cut the banking system right out. And then you see kind of now what Ripple's doing, trying to throw their, uh, their hat in the mix. It kind of, you start to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, I think there's plenty of space for them. I mean, look at USDT. Just the other day, they printed another billion tethered, right? So there's definitely a need. And like what Mario was saying, the more the more competition they have, the more robust our ecosystem becomes, the better it is when we hit kind of hard times or bear markets, it's able to survive. But when you look at like the total market of uh, market cap of stable coins, it pulled back in the bear market but we never hit those lows, right? And then now we're making new highs. So just like looking at a trend, you know, we go higher and then we come down, not as low as before, and then we go higher. So the market keeps getting bigger and bigger and it just makes it more liquid. And that's what we need, right? To become the 12th sector, you're gonna need all of this liquidity. So I, I think there's plenty of space for them to have uh, their own stable coin. Andrew Cashflow, this is another tweet we got from Brad Garlinghouse this morning, and I think you're going to find this to be very interesting. Launching a stable coin is a natural step for Ripple as we bridge the gap between traditional finance and crypto. We have number one, the years of experience, number two, the regulatory framework, number three, a strong balance sheet, and number four, a network with near a network with near global payout coverage to offer the best enabled payments using XRP and our future stable coin together. So Brad Garlinghouse is elaborating. This is going to make it easier to onboard new investors. And I'm going to continue to reiterate their prediction is that this market's going to reach 2.8 trillion by 2028. And they're ready to take the number three spot here. What are some of your thoughts and comments? So what is number five in this, uh, in this list? Number five is reluctant banks because they don't like it at all. You're eating the the chicken with the golden eggs or the goose with the golden eggs, you know? So uh, Brett is, is totally right with what he's saying here. But I think the, the, the traditional banking system is sitting there like, oh my God, what is happening? How can we delay it as long as possible? And that's what I think that, uh, that the SEC is doing with, uh, with Gary Gensler. They are delaying everything, delaying, delaying, and delaying. So to milk the cow as long as possible, but what we see here, it is inevitable that, that there will be competition for the, for the, for the central banks, for, for other banks in, in money, money uh, uh, remittance. And so I think it, it's a very good uh, uh, development here in the world to get everybody access to the, to the banking systems from, from major companies, from smaller people, also in, in underdeveloped countries. So, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy with, with this crypto environment, and, and not only because we can make money, but what it can mention for the rest of the world. And that's what's so exciting, Andrew, is that we often focus on the United States because that has the largest share in this market. That's where most of the global money is. But when you really think about it, other companies are sorry, other countries are not only setting up frameworks to adopt crypto assets. They're starting to put them on their balance sheets. We're seeing it in Asia. We're seeing it in the UAE. So whether Gary Gensler decides to die on this hill or not. This market is going to evolve and innovators are going to continue to innovate, Mario. That's what I think we're seeing right here with Ripple. We got 1,966 live listeners joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. And this person always comes in with the Charles Hoskinson comments. 
Today is a ripple centric episode. We are going to get into some, to some other topics, but Gonzo. Yeah, yeah. I just want to add something you reminded me of when you talked about nation states adding, you know, digital assets to their bank, uh, to their balance sheets. Right. So there's a wallet that, that, um, that's being tracked. They call it uh, Mr. 100 because every day that wallet buys a hundred Bitcoin. When we got the dip, they bought more. Uh, wouldn't be surprised. The talk of the town is that at some point in this cycle, I think that wallet is going to be identified and it might be a nation state that's been buying that much Bitcoin to put on their balance sheet. Now, it could be the signal for the top, depending on when it gets announced. Right. So keep an eye on that. But there is a wallet that buys 100 Bitcoin every day. And when we get dips, it buys bigger. Uh, that amount of Bitcoin, it, it, it might end up being a nation state, a different nation state that's putting uh you know, Bitcoin on its balance sheet. That is really interesting, Gonzo. But I always I have this rule, never talk about Johnny Crypto unless he's on the show. And I think he just kind of exposed his Bitcoin accumulation there. We got 2017 live listeners showing us. Show us some love. Smash that like button. For anyone who doesn't understand humor, I guess this is an introduction to that as well. But let's break down something interesting, Gonzo. The blockchain backer tweeted this out this morning, and this is the total coin market cap excluding the top 10 tokens. And I know you read this type of data all the time, so I'd love to start with you on this topic. He said, this is a challenge of the market right now. It's deciding whether to expand or reject from its retrace or a third range boundary. There haven't been any lower lows, but we can clearly see we are at a struggle point. This is where opportunity is made. We are on the precipice of breaking up. We're on the precipice of breaking down. And I did just want to get some very brief comments here from Gonzo and we'll move forward. Yeah, that's the others, which excludes the top 10 in... And it's been running pretty hard. You know what I see, Abs, is I see one giant cup and handle forming, right? Like when we get a correction in the altcoins, because look, when Bitcoin, it's not exact, but when Bitcoin pulls back 5%, you get 10 to 15 in the altcoins. You get 10% in Bitcoin, you start pushing up to 15 to 20. We get a 20% correction plus in Bitcoin, you're going to get a 50% in altcoins, right? Especially when they're smaller market cap. So I can clearly see what I see is if we get a significant pullback, uh, like everyone's expecting in Bitcoin, I can see the others chart pulling back significantly, creating a cup and handle, and then this thing blowing up when uh, Bitcoin goes back to all-time high. And that's what we're all waiting for, right? And I think I broke this down briefly at the beginning of the show. We are going to shift into an AI topic later in the episode because I think many of our listeners could benefit from getting exposure to some of these AI protocols. I watched a really good video. I might have to pin it underneath in the comments last night where they went through and they tiered every single AI AI project in the market today. And some of them were really surprising. Some of the bigger projects were ranked lower on the list and some of the lower market cap projects were ranked higher on the list. And to me, that screamed opportunity. But Gonzo, let's talk about why the AI market could explode because there's something that catches my attention when you brought up the earthquake in Taiwan before the episode. I am seeing uh, Mario that Mario has to run. So I'd love Mario to give, get a chance to say goodbye. Thank you for joining us. And we always appreciate you jumping on, Mario. Yeah, it was great being here. I love you guys. Hope you all have a beautiful day. And uh, yeah, be well. well. As always, Mario. Love we'll, you. We'll see you soon, my friend. And when it comes to the AI exploding, the NVIDIA factory, just something happened in Taiwan. And I'd love for you to elaborate on that, Gonzo. So I'm going to timestamp this portion of the video. What happened in AI that will make this market explode? It's a supply and demand game. And we just got something huge that happened. So floor is yours. Yeah. So, you know, we've already seen with the creation of uh, AI and everything that's gone on, you need these H100 NVIDIA chips that do language modeling. It's the most data intensive part of kind of the whole AI narrative. And so you have projects that haven't been released at like Ether, IO.net, GPU.net. Gaiman was released recently. They have a partnership with Ether where, or it's even like Akash and uh, AIOZ, right? Those are all have a business model where they take some of these GPU and they and they basically kind of rent it out. I'm breaking it down very simply. And so you already have a shortage of these GPUs because AI is growing basically uh, 10x every 18 months, but the hardware only grows 2x in that same period. That's why you have these projects that are the deep in projects that are being released. Well, there was an earthquake in Taiwan and it affected one of the NVIDIA factories. So that's just going to add more delays more shortage of these GPU ships. So as a narrative, I can see these projects kind of capitalizing, not that it's okay that something happened in Taiwan and I'm sure there's real people that are hurt, but like that narrative as far as decentralized GPU as a business model, I think is going to run very, very hard this cycle.
with you, Gonzo. And I think a lot of people are focused on XRP and we're going to provide more positive news today. But what we've seen throughout this market is that there are sectors that explode, whether it's gaming, NFTs, we're seeing it with AI right now. There's going to be a tokenization era. There's going to be a payment era. And we're going to see projects like XLM, Algorand, XRP, all move in correspondence. That's just what we've seen in previous cycles. So I want people to remain patient and not be overly concerned with the day-to-day -day price action of some of these projects. People were texting this morning. We were, we're all in these in these private chats and these group chats. I see a tendency for people to get overexcited and then overly negative, right? The news comes out, it's 589. The news doesn't explode the price. We're going to zero. The truth is somewhere in between. And that's typically what I do in this market when I'm looking at these projects. I'm not waiting for these 589. I'm not even waiting for a $10 XRP, guys. If we see a an all-time high break and we reach the 1.618, like Gonzo breaks down every day, that would be about a 5 to $6 XRP. You're going to see a big exit liquidity from myself at those prices because of what we've seen thus far. This market isn't utility-based. It really is based on charts, liquidity, and narratives right now. So just to close it out, I'd like to read this final tw Twitter thread from Ripple, and then we're going to get into some other news. Ripple stated, this move extends our reach into both institutional and DeFi realms, diversifying use cases and enhancing our payment infrastructure to bring the world of traditional and decentralized finance closer together. Ripple stablecoin will be 100% backed by US dollar deposits, US government bonds, and cash equivalents. And Ripple pledges transparency with monthly third party at at the cessations, whatever that means, ensuring trust and reliability. Stablecoins serve as a pivotal entry point to DeFi introducing entrusted enterprise grade stablecoin on the XRPL will generate more use cases, liquidity and opportunities for developers and users alike. Simultaneously, we know the future of crypto is multi-chain. Launching this stablecoin on both the XRPL and Ethereum opens the doors for cross-chain interoperability. There is one more tweet, but let's pause it there guys. Interoperability is the way forward. We can talk about what happened with the internet. We can talk about how it's not sustainable for even Ethereum to scale without interoperability. We see the XRPL positioning themselves here. Before we get into some more articles, Gonzo, what do you think about this? Why do you believe they're choosing to launch on Ethereum, first of all? And second of all, what does this mean that the stablecoin will be launched on both blockchains? It acts as its liquidity, right? I mean, Ethereum, you can say what you want about it, you can love it or hate it, but it's the biggest ecosystem that we have that's smart contract capable, right? That is EVM capable. That's the software package that's on Ethereum. That's why most of these projects make themselves capable or to speak to EVM, right? They're EVM compatible. Solana does its own thing, right? It's its, its own chain. But there are projects that connect Solana and, and, and Ethereum. And it's just all about liquidity and being able to access that liquidity. And when... And when you can access that liquidity, when you're when you're thinking in technical terms, as far as like the software package, it's so that they can build, right? So when developers come and they want to build things, right? It's they're going to build in the biggest ecosystem, or they're going to build something that connects to the biggest ecosystem. So whether it's the financial part, which is the liquidity, the money that it could be shared, or on the technology side. It's EVM compatible. So the software package speaks to the other one so that developers can build things. Because when you're a developer, what do you want? You want eyes on your project, right? You want activity, you want network effect. And so you're going to look for the biggest ecosystems or you're going to at least connect to the biggest ecosystems. Same thing when it comes on the financial part of it, you're going to want to access that liquidity, right? Because if you're a closed system and you don't have a lot of liquidity, then eventually that project dies, right? And that's why the interoperability thing is so important, right? That layer, so all of these blockchains connect so that they share liquidity. And let's kick it over to Andrew Cashflow. We are going to break down a very important Twitter thread from somebody we cover often, Anders on Twitter. He breaks down the road to a US dollar stablecoin and what it could mean in the long term. But first of all, what are some of your key takeaways from what Gonzo had to say, as well as the tweet we broke down? Um. You know, but what you see actually that uh, Ethereum also already has a long time. It has the Ethereum virtual machine and it, and, it, and it has proven its stability. So what you see, a lot of other uh, ecosystems, for example, Cosmos, they have a, a link to the Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, 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 XRP is with, uh, with Flare also connected into the Ethereum network. So you see more and more networks in, in entangling with each other. And I think that that's a good case because I think every network has its positives and, 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 the, and, and the, the thing they can do best. 
and, and the Ethereum virtual machine is really an excellent machine. And what do you do there? You build smart contracts, you know? So if you can connect from the, from the uh, XRP blockchain into the Ethereum virtual machine, you know, you can just use the environment there. And that also speeds up the, the innovation. Take that in combination with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the ID of the stable coin with, uh, with XRP, you know, it gets, it gets more and more robust and, and it, it's all about trust in the end. So this, this stuff should not break down. It should not, it should just continue going on and, and no, no, uh, no, no defects on the way. So I, I think we are uh, yeah, approaching a very good uh, era with, with possibilities. And what, what I like the most is all those uh, crypto uh, blockchains, they are not competitors of each other. You know, often we talk about Solana competing with, uh, with, with Ethereum. And, but in the end, we all need to, need to work together to get this crypto uh, uh, universe or metaverse up and running and, and, and running in the world because it is the best for the world to get decentralized with uh, with with your own uh, you know, with, with your own uh, liquidity in your in your own money without all those central authorities that are just uh, you know, limiting you in your possibilities absolutely andrew and we are seeing big institutions and big global organizations starting to leverage this technology yesterday we covered some breaking news and people wanted us to elaborate on it just a little bit more the court documents recently revealed that nearly all of ripple's revenue is coming from selling xrp and Crypto Eddie was asking, she's interested in ways that that may change. Many of our listeners may not have known that 100% of Ripple's revenue comes from selling XRP to private institutions, but that's about 200 million XRP per month. Just I went back, I checked all the data. It's about 174 million, if you want to get really specific, XRP that Ripple is exiting from the escrow into institutions. And people are wondering, is that hurting the price? What I will say is, it's definitely not helping the press, right? <laughs> it's definitely not, it's not doing us any favors over on this side as the XRP investor. But Gonzo, I did want to break down just a little bit of TA for our listeners. We put a question in the live chat. I want to get as many answers as possible on this. Right now we have, let me check. We have 105 votes. Vote in our YouTube live chat. Will XRP reach $1 by 2024? If you can't vote on YouTube and you're watching on Twitter, throw a one in the live chat for yes. Throw a two in the live chat for no. But Gonzo, when we're looking at XRP in particular, we saw massive bullish momentum over the last couple of weeks with a quick retrace right after the fact. So it's another example of XRP pump, dump, pump, dump. We're seeing nothing but the same. Now, we did create a slight lower low here, which is a bearish sign for the market. But I did want to kick it over to you for some more long-term TA. I don't know if this is the XRP chart, is this? No, I'll pull it up. I'll pull it okay. up. I'll pull up the XRP chart. It so, is right here. That's what I've been trying uh, to figure out when it comes to the momentum yeah. of XRP, Gonzo. Yeah. We know that the 94 cent range has a long time been that, that wall of resistance we've been watching since the lawsuit. But as you can yeah. tell, and I'm going to share your screen now, this data really does speak for itself about where we are over the last couple of weeks. Massive bullish momentum, unsustainable, comes back down. Even this morning, look at where that trend line retested. And with that being said, I'd love for you to break it down. Yeah, if you look, like this seems like we found the support right here. That's why I put the box here. This goes back to like February, right, where we kind of broke that 53 cent support. And now we're holding this one. We've had a couple of wicks, but this seems like our support level right here. But you can see what happened this morning, right? Like we've come up and then we have like this, I call these momentum trend lines. And we're not going to see any kind of price action until we break this trend line, right? And so you can see we went right up to it. And I could even pull this down like a little bit, right? Uh, make sure that I'm not in logarithmic. And then we got rejected, right? And that's usually what happens. So until we kind of like break out of this thing, and then now like we need to get above that same kind of 74 cent level, which is where we had that big candle, that'll be the next kind of resistance. Once we break out of here, we're going to have to get above that, right? That's just like zooming in. But it seems like, you know, if you're new to the project, you're looking like, well, should I buy, not buy? This this bottom support right here has held. If we get rejected and we come back down, we got to see if we can hold it. But I think we will. I, I think this will be, this is kind of like our new support level right here. And I just want to clarify. So what you're, what you're looking for is a, a break and confirmation above that trend line. But when it comes mm -hmm. to XRP, we move so explosively that if we do break out of that trend line, do you believe that we could go to that 80, 90 cent range very, very quickly? It might not be sustainable, but the evidence kind of says that when we do pump, it lasts for about a day and it all happens at once. Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm get, we're getting to the point with the cycle, with the halving and everything. I zoomed out just to show you guys like 
the weekly chart and what we've done, right? Uh, we talked about it yesterday. But yeah, that momentum trend line, usually once we break it is where it goes explosive. It just depends on what Bitcoin's doing, right? So if if we get to a point where we're breaking that, where we've already done the halving and Bitcoin's now pushing up towards you know higher levels and making its all time high, I think that's where it can kind of break. But you can see, we just kind of keep creating these levels where now we're at 74 cents. And then the big one is right here is that is that almost that dollar level, right? And it's that psychological level that we really need to get above. But that's what XRP does, right? Like when it breaks out, when you look here, when it breaks out, it breaks out, right? It just hasn't done that yet, right? We're kind of just kind of ranging around in this area, but we still need to get the real explosive breakout that's going to take us back to previous highs. Agree with you, Gonzo. And let's just talk about this a little bit more. If you can draw, are you able to go back to the 2017 all-time high and possibly draw a 1618 Fibonacci and see where that takes sure. us? Because the reason that me and Gonzo are breaking this down is because, excuse me. Let's see, 2017, this one right here, right? The reason me and Gonzo are breaking this down is because every single bull run, Bitcoin has reached the 1.618 and that's been the peak of the market, right? I believe it's three of the last four bull runs. Bitcoin touches these ranges. We can apply that same concept to many of the altcoins. If XRP breaks out of this six, eight year trading range, we are definitely going to see a 1.618, at least using prior data. And that's why I'm using that as one of my first exit targets. But Gonzo, from this point, yeah. I'd like for you to break down some of the higher trading ranges. Really $2.70 sticks out to me. What are some of the others that stick out to you? Yeah, you can see where we got rejected. This is like on going, like you said, going back. This is the 618. This is kind of my trading setup. Well, we got kind of rejected the 618 and we came back down. But if you're looking for the higher levers, it's like $2.70. I've mapped these out before. These are my, like, these are just my exit prices. Five, 580, 670, right? And then it goes up as high as 14 and 15, right? If we hit these, these are very parabolic up here. These are five and six spot extensions that you don't see right now because it just makes the, the, the chart messy. But that's just my plan. But most of it will be coming out here, right, at the $14, $15 level if we get there. If we don't, then I just hold on. Remember, this is long-term investing. This is not get rich quick, right? Absolutely. But you can see what you're talking about with the 618. This is where we came down to. So I imagine when we go up, when we start to have issues, we'll have issues at these levels, the $1.32 level, which is where we had issues here. And then I see it happening here. But once we break out of here, like – right? Like once we break the golden pocket, which the golden pocket is right here. That's why I have this level right here. There's some gematria that goes into it too. Absolutely. But that's just Let I'm me doing. address this one question here. Cause he's, this person, T-Man Bond makes a good point, And I want to clarify, he said, it's sad when the whole community wants to sell at a price, zero confidence in my usage. If there is one, well, we're not talking about dumping the whole token. If I had 10 XRP tokens, I'm not telling you I'm selling 10 of them at a certain price. I'm going to take 10%, 20% off the table. And depending on if we hit some of these higher price targets, yes, I will be taking some profit. That's the point of investing is you'd like to lock in some profits, maybe go buy a home, maybe put it into your business. There's other things besides cryptocurrency, guys. And, and I do this show. This is what I do. We're more bullish on crypto than anyone else. But I do think it's safe. If you're going to go through a four-year bull run, take some profit off the table. I just, I, I'm only speaking from experience. This is not financial advice. Taking profit off the table will help you sleep better at night, not only during a bull run, but during a bear market. So I don't know if you had any Listen, comments. Yeah, if your investment thesis is maybe you're financially free or maybe you're content and happy with your lifestyle, right? Like maybe you don't have any issues with money and your bills are paid or you don't have bills or what have you. And, and you, you're invested in this and you're going to hold this for 10, 15 years. That is awesome for you. Everybody's different. I am here to make money right? That, that's what I'm here for, right? I'm here to change my life, my family's life, and our community's lives, right? And so I have a portion of XRP that is taken into the future for that. But in the meantime, in the present, when I can make some money now and do what Abs is talking about, pay off my house, pay off my car, then I'm going to do that, right? Because But everybody's different. If that's not what you're here to do, you're here for technology or for the future, great for you. That's what I'm doing. So like, and I think a lot of people that are in this space, you could just see it from the meme frenzy, right? Why are those people investing in memes? They're not because of the technology or because it's the future of blockchain. They're trying to make money, right? And so instead of investing in memes, I'm looking for projects that have real utility, but I'm going to take some into the future and some I'm going to take profits on, right? And that's just to me. 
Floor is yours, cash flow. You, you know, the, the difficulty often is, especially when you start listening to all, all the influencers and the YouTubers, they all speak from their own perspective. And that's exactly what Gonzo is meaning. So, you know, if you have a trader, a short-term trader, he, he will say, oh, you have to go out now and then you have to go in and you get totally confused. But if you're a long time, long-term holder over maybe two or three more Bitcoin cycles, you, you, you will just be there and you're fine with everything. So, you know, what is most important that on every moment of the day that you have a strategy and that you know what you need, need to do. And you can only do three things, buy, sell, or do nothing. And as soon as you have a strategy, by the way, I, I teach that in my uh, Smart Investor program. So if you're interested, look at uh, andrewcashflow.com. But uh, uh, there you learn exactly with the calculators. The calculators tell you where to go in, where to go out. That also eliminates your emotions. And if you go from there, Everything gets so much easier because it doesn't matter what somebody tells you. You know, you just, just say, I have my plan. I'm doing what I must do. And then it also helps very much if you have a specific goal, for example, paying off your car or paying off your house or paying for the study of your children. So then you at least you have a goal. And then you also you can also sell a portion of your crypto to, to accommodate that goal. And then you say, you know, okay, I, I saw... The crypto went higher maybe in the future, but still I accomplished my goal and I was able to do it, to do this for my family, for my friends, for, for, for the world, doesn't matter. So, you know, having a strategy, most important and eliminating your, uh, your emotions. Here's another thing I'd like to remind people of that being a hodler is a very smart strategy in the crypto market, but you're playing a multi-year game. So how are you going to watch the day-to-day -day prices if you are a long-term hodler? 11 years ago, April 3rd, 2013 bitcoin broke 100 dollars. think about that bitcoin broke 100 only 11 years ago if you are playing a 10 11 year game and we're staring at the xrp price chart these are not the things you should be concerned with we're talking about day-to-day -day investors what people can anticipate over the next few weeks few months are our listeners going to make some money is that going to be exciting we always hope so we're not we're, that doesn't apply to our long-term strategy and i just wanted to reiterate that if you held Bitcoin 11 years ago to today and did nothing but keep it in a cold wallet and, and sleep well at night, your $100 is now worth $65,000. And do you think you're concerned about a 5% pullback? Absolutely not, because you have a different, a completely different strategy. And so, Gonzo, I'd like to get some closing comments, and then we'll move forward. Yeah, I think Raul Paula said it best. Like, he did the numbers, and he found that if he would have just held and then dollar cost average in the bear markets and keep holding, he would have made more money. But so it just depends on on where you're at. And like like we said, if, if you're a long-term holder and you don't care about day-to-day -day or this cycle, then you just keep DCAing and then you hold on and you wait for the future to come, right? But some people are trying to like live in the present and make certain moves because they have certain goals, right? And here's another thing too. If you set a goal, like if you set a goal in the bear market and you said, okay, I, I want to make, let's say $100,000 right? Because I want to, that's going to pay off my house or whatever that is. Make sure that as the cycle continues and things get really nuts, that you execute that goal, right? Because what people have a tendency to do is to move the goalpost. And then that's when they start getting wrecked. If you said that you wanted to do something because that money was going to be life-changing for you, you're going to be able to pay something off or do something with that, then execute that plan. And then don't follow the crypto anymore because you're just going to drive yourself crazy, right? Because it's probably going to still keep going up. But don't move the goalpost because when you move the goalpost and you start making moves that you didn't plan for, that's when you get wrecked. Agree with you, Gonzo. And I just want to give a brief reminder right here, guys. Tomorrow, we will be debuting and unleashing part three of XRP Unleashed. This is a documentary that's been being made over several months. And I just want to remind people tomorrow morning, 11 a.m., click the notification bell below this video so you can be reminded part three is going to be launching on this show. So that's going to be a really exciting uh video and this one is the longest it's the longest trailer we've played so the previous ones are two minutes this is slightly longer with more detail very very exciting now this is some news that is shocking and this has over 1.2 million views on twitter ethereum gate is coming to light we've got this man his name is james o'keefe on twitter and i've seen him on my tiktok and things of that nature where he goes and he kind of calls out politicians and and he's a, a, a self-funded journalist, so he doesn't work for any major network. 
But what he's breaking down is the allegations that happened with Ethereum and the initial ICO that took place, exploring the allegations that the U.S. government agencies attempt to silence a whistleblower and monopolize the crypto industry, hashtag ETHgate. And he goes on to post this long paragraph along with an 18-minute video. Would you guys be interested in having uh, Stephen Array off on this show? Let me know in the comments because we have been in communication. That's something I'm interested in. So we could definitely have Stephen on. I'd love to hear from our live chat if you're interested in that as well. But here's what's interesting, Gonzo. This is going mainstream. 1.2 million views on a single account. I saw a bunch of other tweets that were recognizing this. This probably got over 5, 3 million views on Twitter alone yesterday. Get ready. These people must be shaking in their boots with the truth coming to light. And I did just want to get some of your thoughts. First of all, we've got the narrative of the SEC denying Ethereum being a security or a commodity. They will not make definitive statements. We also have an investigation going on, but that is into, from my research, that is into proof of stake, the proof of stake shift that happened in 2022. That is completely different from what we're talking about today with the ICO and some of the illegal things that may have taken place. So First of all, what's your initial reaction to this article hitting the mainstream news? But second of all, the fact that this is going mainstream, catching people's attention with several million views on Twitter. When you look at the May deadline that's approaching for that spot ETF, and you're looking for, okay, well, they can't use the reasons that they denied in the past because Grayscale won that case. And then now you start looking like, okay, they're going to have to deny or approve or maybe do something that they've never done before, which is delay, then you start looking at stories like this, it could be that the SEC comes out and says, look, we have to delay this thing because we're, we have an open investigation, right? So it could be all just ammunition to help them either delay or deny the spot ETF that's coming up in May, right? Uh, which is gonna affect the price, which is when we looked at the chart, remember the, the, the Bitcoin Ethereum pairing that's at support, could be that final flush out and then the correction in ETH USD and then the news change later on and then you know we go from there right but something to pay attention to if they're going to be attacking uh proof of stake right because a lot of the protocols are proof of stake as opposed to proof of work which is mining and remember the problem with proof of stake is the guaranteed return that is the initial problem that the SEC has is that if I'm putting my ethereum onto the the native blockchain and they even offer me 1% now I'm getting profit from the work of a small organization, according to the SEC. I'm just giving you the BS that they tell us. So, Andrew Cashflow, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts, and then we'll continue. <laughs> it is so it is so idiot. I mean, if if we make with stocks and a company, if we make dividends, everything is okay. And if we make staking rewards, which is it is not the same, but it is comparable. And then the world is too small, and uh, and, and it's not allowed, and and you have to ban them. And yeah, I I know why because just the simple human beings that we are are also able to make money with our own with our own crypto and with our own wallets and it's totally outside the banking system and the the, the fees that are involved are also eliminated so it's it's way cheaper and i think it hurts i already talked about it in in this in this episode but it is hurting the the the, the traditional banking system because they make fees out of everything and that, that's diminishing. So, yeah, you know, will the ETF in May be approved? Not so sure. I think it will be delayed a little bit more. May, maybe in the in the fall it will come. Will it be there in future? Absolutely. So be prepared, you know, when the when Ethereum will be approved as an ETF, also in the in the in the in the run up towards that moment. Ethereum will see also an, in, in, in a, a significant rise in price. But you know, guys, if you can, just dollar cost average a little bit in, in Ethereum and, and, and position yourself because of that event. You know, the best coins are still Bitcoin, Ethereum. Maybe not so exciting, but 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 as, as, as all those meme coins and other coins that go up and down much more. But if you really want to be a, a stable investor with, with, with decent returns, you know, the, the time the time is here at the moment. Agree with you, cash flow. And we got 2,927 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. And Gonzo, there's two articles I'd like to kind of combine for this last segment because we're short on time. First of all, this was some breaking news from this morning. Hedge funds are shorting Bitcoin at record levels. And this graphic really does speak for itself. What is your reaction to what we're seeing with Bitcoin right now? Are people becoming overly negative? Are they overly positive? 
What is your perspective on hedge funds opening up all of these shorts when we know the Bitcoin having is 17 days away? Do they know something we don't? Well, if we can, can we pull up the chart, uh, Abs? Sorry, let me look this up. Could be the Bitcoin yeah. chart. Yeah, I, I try not to let the news media like, uh, you know, show me the way. But you can see what we're doing. Like this is that same chart that we've been looking at. And, you know, we're kind of in this, uh, this flag right and this is and and all we're doing is just bouncing up and down right when you zoom in like we bounced this was a 618 i removed the fibs and now we're moving up and we're probably going to go up here and then we're going to get rejected right and then we're going to come down so what we need to do is if we break this level we're going up if we lose down to this level then we're going down right and so i just lean in the tna i know it's like indecisive but you let the chart tell you where we're going we're, I think we're definitely going up here and then we have to wait to see if we're going to get rejected. If we don't break that 70K level, right, and then get above here, then we're probably coming back down, right? And then we have to see if we hold support. But um, yeah, you remember, you could get a hell of a short squeeze and that's usually what happens, especially if we come up here and everyone is shorting it because everyone's expecting this. That's where you get a short squeeze where all of a sudden price will gap up and then go up. But because we're hitting the Bitcoin halving, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we're just kind of trending kind of sideways, right? We're just kind of in this range and we're going to continue to be in that range. I don't foresee any uh, major collapse unless we lose this major support level right here at 60K, 61K. And those are important ranges for everyone to make note of, Gonzo, because for the time being, Bitcoin <clears throat> controls the market. And if we do see Bitcoin break out into new all-time highs, that's when we're going to see these altcoins go parabolic at the same time. To close out this episode, I'd love for us to talk about the thread that Anders did on his Twitter account where he was talking about the utility and what this XRPL stablecoin really means. But let's read a quick statement here from David Schwartz. Sorry, somebody keeps calling my phone. Um, let me share my screen here, Gonzo. Let's read a couple of statements from David Schwartz and then we'll close this show out. A high quality US dollar stablecoin on the XRPL with its decentralized exchange and featured like issued currencies, auto bridging, and the AMM will be game changers for users and developers. We're seeing many of these important amendments come into effect over these last couple of weeks, Gonzo. And I think as this market and these blockchains continue to evolve, people will start moving into the best products. If the XRPL becomes a diverse ecosystem, you can launch coins, you can create NFTs, you can do all of these exciting things, as well as take advantage of a stable coin. It's going to be a, a main competitor with any other blockchain out there trying to lead in this market. And I just wanted to get some thoughts. I'm looking for that Anders tweet, and that's what I'll close it out with. Yeah, look, this is investing, right? And and it's a long-term game, right? And when you look at projects, whether it's Ethereum, Binance, projects from the other cycle that were infrastructure bets, when you think about where they came out with their kind of ICO, IDOs, their, their launch prices, and people that have held them for multiple cycles, you can see how well they've done. And they're basically infrastructure bets, right? And so it's the same thing with either the ISO tokens we're talking about, XRP. They are building the infrastructure. Unfortunately, in the market right now, what gets what, what, what gets mainstream is the attention, the narratives, right? I think AI still, it has staying power, DeepIn does, but that needs to still play out. But when you look at like the ISO tokens and, and what those companies are building, it's just a long-term play and you just have to be patient. Absolutely, guys. And Clinton, you might have a great theory here. Is Johnny calling apps to see if his phone is on silent? My phone is always on silent, my friends. But let's close out this show with an interesting Twitter thread, and we'll kick it straight to Andrew Cashflow here. The initial thoughts about Ripple's US dollar stablecoin. So here's kind of the journey that we've taken. XRPL gained clarity as a non-security in July of 2023 inside of the United States, as long as it's not sold by Ripple to institutional investors. The automated market maker just went live on the XRPL, which is important to have high quality US dollar stablecoins issued on the DEX, especially for institutional decentralized finance. Likely that the US will have stablecoin regulations coming in the next year, a bill is likely to pass in 2025. And we started off the show by showing you a video of Senator Loomis explaining how she thinks stablecoins could be passed in the first two quarters of 2024. It's important to overall to have a high quality US dollar stablecoin. Thus, Ripple could issue a US dollar stablecoin on the XRPL, as well as other chains such as Ethereum with seamless operability between other chains it would be issued on in the future. If we can get a stablecoin regulation inside of the US, that would be a large step forward for regulatory compliance solution slash combination. Couple this with the importance of institutional DeFi. 
Ripple stated the end goal for XRP is being the liquidity bridge solution standard between all sorts of chains and assets. This is another step in that direction here, Andrew Cashflow. So I'm really excited. I'm overly bullish, I guess you would say. We only have about 30 seconds. What are some of your thoughts on this latest and last Twitter thread? I think when the US is able to make stablecoin regulation and make do it fast, you know, it will bring so much attention and so much positive news and it will be so much positive for the whole ecosystem of, of, of the whole crypto world and that, that, that would be fantastic and i i can imagine that that brad garlinghouse with with his uh x usd or usdx maybe he will be in a conflict with elon musk but elon also probably uh likes to have x somewhere with usd but uh yeah it will, it will be it will be great and i hope you know us will wake up regulators will wake up and they will see the advantage of the of the innovation because innovation will give uh, uh, labor will give work to everybody and and it's it's yeah because it's exciting andrew cash and i want to give a special thank you to gonzo a special thank you to andrew and a special thank you to all of our live listeners out there if you enjoyed this show show us some love smash that like button and tomorrow xrp unleashed is premiering part three on this show love you guys we'll see you in 23 hours and like